Hey everyone, it's Pacific, and welcome to SCP Archives Season 5. We're back with Week to Week Anthology, and to kick off the season right, a two-part episode. Uh, You can listen to Part 1 right now, and you can listen to Part 2 right now, as soon as you listen to this part. It I promise it won't make as much sense if you don't listen to part one first. Um, But anyways, we got a whole big episode for you. So after you're done with this, make sure you catch part two. After this, we'll be back every single week, uh, plus or minus a few breaks, with new anthology episodes. uh, All the way up until October, where we have something very special and super secret planned. Aside from that, I don't have too much news, uh, but I do want to give a very warm welcome to Travis McMaster and Matt Roy Berger. Uh, Travis is our new sound designer, and Matt is our new musician, and they have done some incredible things this season. Um, I guess you're about to find out. So, without further ado, this week's episode. Warning. The Foundation database is classified. Unauthorized access will result in detainment. Within this archive, you'll find the procedures, descriptions, and accounts of the most notorious anomalies we've encountered to date. Secure. Contain. Protect. Item number SCP-093, Object Class, Euclid, Special Containment Procedures, See Testing Document SCP-093-T1 for outline of testing conditions. SCP-093 must remain on a mirror at all times and under video surveillance. Admittance into the area of SCP-093's containment must be authorized only with proper video recording and subject retrieval procedures in place. Any attempt to use SCP-093 outside of an approved test will be dealt with severely, up to and including termination. SCP-093 is a primarily red disc carved from a stone composite resembling cinnabar with circular engravings and unknown symbols carved at 0.5 centimeters depth around the entire object. Deeper cuts are present on SCP-093 with a depth of 1 to 1.5 centimeters. SCP-093 is 7.62 centimeters in diameter and fits comfortably into most palms without abrasion. SCP-093 will change hue when held by a living individual. The colors taken by SCP-093 are still being researched to establish a link. Current belief holds that the changes depend upon regrets carried by the holder. SCP-093 has been observed to travel in the largest possible circle while rolling, building up phenomenal speed. The mechanism of this acceleration is currently unknown. If an obstacle is between SCP-093 and the nearest mirror-like surface, it will use this momentum to punch through the obstacle and continue on its course at this speed. It will only stop when a mirror-like surface is contacted. Despite tremendous impact velocities, no damage will be dealt to SCP-093 or the mirror. Additional Notes No records exist to clarify the nature of SCP-093's discovery or presence in the Foundation. See SCP-093-OD. Since no records exist explaining SCP-093's method of containment, a test procedure was initiated to establish why mirrors must be used to contain it. The results of SCP-093-T1 led to the discovery of living beings holding SCP-093 being able to move through mirrors and the series of tests in SCP-093-T2 to ascertain the destination reached through this travel. SCP-093 original documentation as follows.
Item number, SCP-093, Object Class Euclid, Special Containment Procedures. Item SCP-093 is to be kept on a silver-lined mirror on a .3 by .23 meters, 1 foot by 9 inches, pedestal, at least 1.22 meters, 4 feet, off the ground floor in containment cell block C. Object is not to be contained in areas exceeding 3.66 by 3.05 meters, 12 by 10 feet, nor placed on mahogany, pine, cherry, or aluminum pedestals above or below level 1 of containment cell block C. Object can be handled safely, albeit gently, without consequences. Tests and consequences thereof involving containment conditions can be viewed in Section B-35-1 of the attached report. Description. Object was found on the shore of the Red Sea, January 30th, 1968, emitting a low sigh and a dim blue gleam. Its color has since turned into an orange mix of red, only emitting a hum of varying volume whilst in the presence of female examiners of ages between 34 and 41. SCP-093 resembled the documented blue for 54 minutes and 34 seconds at 1.23 on April 26, 1986, coincidentally when the body of 194-9834 was discovered in Research Facility Omega. Ties between 194-9834 and SCP-093 remain inconclusive, and effects of prolonged exposure to 093 remain unknown, except for infrequent reports of periods of calmness, and in the case of 242-0049, as periodic waves of depression, loss of balance, and thoughts of suicide. These feelings have reportedly not exceeded 11 days in duration. Object seemed to react to the presence of 242-0056 by turning light violet for no more than 2 minutes and 9 seconds, as documented on March 12, 1993. Effects of this reaction remain unknown. Additional Notes Origins of 093 remain unknown, and documents of recovery of 093 have since been destroyed in a fire in Research Facility Omega, December 9, 1989. Reports on the feelings of researchers who handled 093 have remained inconsequential since April 19, 1995. SCP-093-T1 Containment test testing of SCP-093 against conditions set forth for existing containment procedures to assess viability of continuing such containment, beginning with changing the type of mirror used as a position of rest. Mirrored surface, brass frame, retail grade mirror. SCP-093 rests without activity when placed on the mirror. This test alone removes the need for costly silver or wooden containment systems. Standard Grade Table SCP-093 turns upright and begins to roll across the table surface in one direction, making a U-turn and rolling to the other, completing an oval shape and repeating this action until a mirror is brought into vicinity of it, at which time SCP-093 rolls toward the mirror and lays flatways against it, sliding towards the center. It is noted that despite the grainy feel of SCP-093, it does not mark the mirror in any fashion while moving across it. Two mirrors at either end of a standard grade table. SCP-093 gravitates towards the closer mirror regardless of orientation and makes no distinction between different types of mirrors favoring a factor of distance above all else and choosing the mirror to move to. A mirror held by a person and moved around. SCP-093 follows the mirror as it moves, gaining speed until a maximum velocity of 60 km per second is reached. At any velocity, the impact of SCP-093 against a mirrored surface results in no damage to either object. A person holding SCP-93 placing it on a mirror. This test was accidental, the result of one of the staff tripping another after some debate about who would be covering the lunch tab. As a result of the behavior of the researchers, 
It was discovered that a person holding SCP-093 and placing it against a mirror will in fact move into the mirror. Addendum. Containment testing discontinued after establishing that SCP-093 requires only a mirror to rest inert. Testing on human interaction with mirrors while holding SCP-093 authorized by Dr. Sean Phillips. SCP-093-T2. Mirror test. Testing protocols. Subjects testing SCP-093 must wear a Class 3 buckle harness strapped to the chest and attached to a tension pulley system allowing for 300 meters, approximately 1,000 feet, of movement. Additional spools may be added to extend movement if necessary. The clasp connecting these spools must be high-grade and capable of withstanding applied force of 0.2 tons. A field kit containing the following should be standard issue for testing SCP-093. One wrist-mounted light source with three hours lifespan and additional power sources providing up to six additional hours. Four 0.5 liter water bottles with water. Four MREs of any type, plus two plain granola bars. Chocolate chips allowed. One standard issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 24 rounds of ammunition. Loaded. This is not to be issued until subject is passed into a mirror using SCP-093 and should be given under armed supervision, ensuring that the subject passes through entirely. This item is to be requisitioned first upon subject's return and subject to be made aware of this before leaving line of sight within SCP-093's mirror. One standard issue field knife. The subject is not to be made aware of this item and must find it on their own within the kit. The subject must also be attached to a video system with a camera mounted on the subject's head or shoulders. The video device should be cable-based and allow for the same length of travel as the return system. Wireless cameras have shown mixed results and should only be used in testing conditions where SCP-093 is a currently known color. New colors must be tested using wired feed. During testing, the color of SCP-093 must be recorded, as well as history of the subject in terms of their incarceration to identify how SCP-093 determines the color to assume. A link appears to be connected to guilt or a lack thereof in the subject's psyche. The attached test results should be accessed in order. Blue, green, violet, yellow, and finally, red. Mirror test one, color, blue. Subject is D20384, male, 34 years of age, strong physique, Subject's background shows instance of murder slash attempted suicide. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a blue color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to an outdoor landscape heavily tinged in blue. Video transcript as follows. Camera activates, flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same field reported by technicians. Looks like typical lowland plains. Everything has a heavy blue tinge overlapping the normal colors. No discernible landmarks visible as subject pans view left to right. Only grass, weeds, and a breeze moving the taller grass. No trees, no living beings visible. Subject moves forward as instructed, traveling for approximately 500 steps before something becomes visible. A patch of the land up ahead is barren and grass can be seen dying as subject approaches it. Approximately 300 steps forward, subject is standing before a hole in the ground. The hole has been dug using unknown tools of primitive origin. Pulley system engaged and the camera suffers a light shudder. 
Subject is instructed to enter the hole and, after mild protesting, agrees to do so. There is no apparent method of descent such as a ladder or rope. Subject relies entirely on his own hands and the pulley system to slow the descent. Approximately 100 meters of cable is used before a bottom is reached. Light source provided in field kit activated 50 meters down when outside sources become unreliable. Sweeping gestures of the light reveal nothing more than dirt, even at the bottom of the hole. Subject moves forward with assistance of light source, asked about the blue tinge. Subject expresses confusion and says there is no such tinge from his perspective, and never was. Light is visible down the passage, and 150 meters of cable has been used. Out of the camera's eye, sound is recorded of the firearm being prepared. When questioned about these actions, subject states justified precaution and moves forward. The tunnel turns from bare dirt to a concrete enclosure. Subject complains of a stench. The light source is revealed to be ceiling light fixtures, a series of which, with less than a quarter broken, while the others function. A series of six doors, three to a side, span down the camera view with a seventh door visible at the end of the corridor that has been blocked by what looks like generic metal shelving debris. Debris shows signs of rusting and is typical of retail store units, suggesting other human presences. Subject requested to try doors in whatever order he chooses. Subject tries first door on right. Doors locked, does not open. Second door tries to open, but does not budge. Unlocked, but blocked. Closing second door, third door is tried, same results as first. Going up the other side, the third door does open fully and light is bright in the room. Portable light switched off at this time as subject pans camera to inspect room. Room is bare, no contents, but walls are filthy. Subject states material on walls isn't dirt, but can't identify it. Seems to resemble melted plastic, but is brown in color rather than black. Door is closed. Second door on left side has no handle, does not move when pushed. The hole where the handle was is plugged by unknown material. All doors are shaped in such a way that nothing can visibly escape from the sides and space for movement is too thin to look through even at ground level. First door on the left hand is locked, but part of the key is present in lock from stem to the ridge. The back has been broken off. With effort, subject manipulates key to open door and immediately begins coughing, complaining of a stench. Walls of room are clean as is floor. Ceiling is coated in the same strange brown material as the third room. In this room, there is a makeshift cot made from aged blankets with a pillow. A wooden crate containing open boxes of what appears to have been foodstuffs. Language appears on video as squiggles, however, subject states they simply read cereal. A second crate in the room contains what appears to be empty water bottles that have dried out. A book lays next to the cot, closed, no title or identifying marks. On the wall is what appears to be clipped articles, but language cannot be read. Subject asked to remove clippings for retrieval. All articles, but one, crumble at the touch due to age. The intact article is put in a field sample container and seems the most recent compared to the others. Asked to investigate the book, the subject begins to move toward it. Audio on the tape goes strange and a high-pitched screeching noise like grinding metal dominates all communication for 3.5 seconds. 
Subject has not touched the book still, and when the noise stops, Subject asks Control to repeat request. Control made no request during that time as headsets were removed. Subject advised to leave room and notes that the door has begun closing slowly on its own and if left alone, will close. Subject advised to leave door alone and to investigate door on right. Careful review of the following 10 seconds of tape shows that as the camera pans, a figure is visible at the end of the tunnel where the seventh door is. The door is open only enough for a face to be seen through a crack just before the door silently closes. No details can be seen. Subject investigates the second door on the right with no mention of anything seen out of the ordinary. This door, when pushed against, moves, and after repeated bashings, moves enough to view inside at an angle. A cork board is visible with more articles attached to it, The top of a box of cereal can be seen on the floor, and what appears to be a hand laying palm up. Subject closes door and pans camera past door 7, which remains closed. Seeing nowhere else to explore, subject requested to return. Subject poses no protest and complains of ever-increasing stench. As subject returns back down tunnel, his camera feed does not change or show anomaly, but control reports a sudden surge in cable movement, pulling an additional 100 meters of cable through before going slack again and then tightening. Video feed shows subject ascending tunnel slowly while control attempts to verify integrity of the pulley system. Subject requested to stop ascent but states he is not climbing. The rope is pulling him up. Panic sets in on both sides and subject informed to ready firearm. Upon reaching top of hole, nothing is visible on camera and subject reports nothing has changed in landscape. Then begins a return trip following the path of the cable. Traveling for approximately 900 steps, subject asks how much cable he has used. Control admits they are unsure due to complications, but subject traveled in a straight line to reach the hole, so it should be a straight line back. Subject becomes concerned when he states that more cable is visible now, moving in a 90 degree angle away from a point in the ground. Subject pans camera around full circle slowly. On film, Behind subject, a crowd of 37 countable figures stand silently. Features are unidentifiable and they are lacking the blue tinge that dominates the landscape. Panic breaks in control again, but subject notes only oddity as being the cable having an angled path. Subject tugs his end of the cable. It is taut and does not move. Control begins to reel in the pulley system, and slack rapidly winds. Watching the angled cable movement can be seen as grass is disturbed further down the angled portion from the reeling in. Then the line vibrates as it meets resistance and emits a twang from the recoil. Subject's camera pans back along length of cable, which now appears to slowly be allowing more slack before suddenly all slack is returned and the pulley system begins again. Control requests subject return following cable path and screams are caught on the audio with panic from subject. Five shots fired as subject aims pistol at something not visible on camera. Control reports being able to see subject returning toward point of origin, while camera shows wire disappearing into a point floating in the air. As subject passes this point, all cable is now in the pulley system, and camera films only the floor. Control reports that the mirror took approximately five seconds to return to a reflection, and SCP-093 remained blue in color until one hour after being recovered from subject. A vile-smelling fluid was present on subject's clothes around his hands when firearm was recovered. This fluid dried quickly and was deemed insignificant of study due to lack of quality sample. Control personnel monitoring the mirror state having seen a massive human being crawling on the ground, easily 50 times the size of a normal person with no facial features and a very short arm reach. 
pulling itself toward the mirror before it returned to a reflection. Due to proximity, fine details could not be made out, but at least one observer noted the being appeared to have been shot from the marks in the otherwise smooth, featureless face. Field's test kit recovered from subject containing a newspaper article that reads and was filed as item Hey, Pacific here with a quick ad break and a reminder. Ad-free and bonus episodes are available at our Patreon at patreon.com slash scp underscore pod. And now, back to the show. Mirror test two. Color, green. Subject is D54493. Female, 23 years of age. Average physique. Subject's background shows instance of Grand Theft Auto and second-degree murder of two children during escape with vehicle. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a green color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a farming landscape, heavily tinged in green, similar to the first test. Video transcript as follows. Subject is looking out over the same farmland reported by technicians. All greens through video feed are deeper and green tinge overlays the normal colors of objects similar to the blue tinge in test 1. No landmarks from test 1 are discernible as subject pans camera over area. Present is a field, long abandoned, in the middle of which stands the remains of a scarecrow of unknown design. Fragments left are rotted and torn. Nothing grows in the tilled land. A farmhouse is visible to the right of the field, large, two stories. A basement shelter entrance is visible at one end. Subject prepares her sidearm immediately and is asked by control to relax before proceeding, her heavy breathing dominating the audio feed. Subject takes a few minutes and announces that she's fine, then proceeds as directed to walk the perimeter of the farmhouse. Children's bicycles, two, a boy's and girl's lay against the house near the shelter doors. One of the doors to the shelter lay in the grass, torn from the entrance as evidenced by splintering wood. On the stairs lay clothes arranged in a descending order, shoes to shirt, going down them, belonging to a boy. Subject begins screaming at Control, asking if this is some sort of sick joke. Control assures her that they have never seen this environment either, and to please calm down. Subject takes several minutes to regain herself before continuing. It is unknown if SCP-093 is linking the subject's past with her landscape. After several minutes, subject agrees to continue. Communication to subject is muted, and conversation of control-making commentary about subject's jittery attitude makes up audio for one and a half minutes. Communication restored as subject reaches bottom of stairs. The cellar of the farmhouse is unremarkable and typical. Several wooden shelves line the far wall containing unidentified canned substances. Broken light fixtures sway gently from support beams. Cameras pan across the basement slowly. No evidence of footprints are visible, and the basement can be assumed to have been abandoned for some time. Subject begins to comment about a stench. As subject pans the area, a metal hatch is visible in the ground similar to a bulkhead on a submarine with a turn handle. Subject remarks that the smell is at its worst around the hatch, and the dirt around the hatch is noted as being clumped and clay-like. The handle of the hatch is old, and the paint chipped. Subject coerced into turning the handle, which, when fully turned, opens the hatch. Subject begins coughing at the release of assumed, old, stale air. When camera is tilted to view down the hatch, it is a white concrete tunnel similar to the one found in the blue experiment, but in much better condition. Subject asks to descend ladder and close hatch behind her. After some convincing, subject agrees to descend but does not close the hatch. 
overlook concerns about severing the pulley return system and doing so are acknowledged. Descent down the ladder and trip to the farmhouse has consumed approximately 53 meters of cable when bottom is reached. The inside of the hatch appears to be a bunker ill-suited to long-term usage. It is spacious, about half the size of the actual cellar itself, containing three bunks, one for a couple and two for single use. Several boxes of food similar to those found during Blue, marked as cereal, fill a waste container near the hatch bottom. On the beds are two skeletons, and on the floor is a third, lying next to which is a simple six-shooter revolver, containing no ammunition. Three spent casings are across the floor near the gun. On the other side of the skeleton is a bound book in good condition. This is retrieved and placed into a field kit container upon request. The gun is left alone per request from control. Subject examines more of the bunker, focusing on a desk where a newspaper has been cut and is in good condition. The clipped articles are recovered using a field kit container. Little else of interest to be brought back is in the bunker as the camera is panned around. Trash bags containing clothing, a few children's toys resembling popular 1950s era products, are lined against the wall. Subject is requested to leave the bunker and then sharply asked to wait by a control technician who directs the camera view to an area near the exiting doorway to the hatch. Closer inspection as subject moves in finds that a small area has been fitted with what appears to be an ethernet jack, the cover of which has been forced slightly away from the wall by a strange amber-like substance. Subject refuses to touch or collect a sample commenting that it stinks so bad that if they want it, they can come get it themselves. Control declines and subject leaves bunker. As subject grips ladder to leave, the camera pans up for a moment and at the top of the tunnel, a humanoid figure is seen peering down. Control asks subject to confirm figure. Subject states nothing is up there and begins to climb. Figure draws out of the camera view after first rung is touched by subject who ascends without incident. At the top of the tunnel, no other life is seen. Nothing has been disturbed. Subject insists nothing was there and closes the hatch, then immediately vomits. Subject coughs and uses a supplied water bottle to gargle, then freezes and asks if Control is hearing that. Control reports no audio. Subject approaches cellar hatch cautiously with firearm drawn and lifts her head out just enough so camera can view the outside area. In the distance, approximately 700 meters from the farm, Two massive, humanoid beings are crawling across the landscape. The entities do not notice the subject who remains quiet, but whose drawn sidearm is visibly trembling. Subject requested to remain still and silent as beings move. They are featureless, facing at an angle moving across the field of vision so the faces are only visible for a few moments. During this time, it is clear they have no facial features. The arms they use to drag themselves are short at times and long at others, stretching out to varying lengths each time they move. There is no rear area to the beings. All bodily design appears to end at the torso. The two creatures take approximately 10 minutes to disappear into the distance before the subject begins to panic and begs to return. Request declined. Subject instructed to enter the home from the cellar and not to leave the home under any circumstances. The first floor is entered through a hatch in the ceiling floor that opens with rusty creaks that causes subject to pause for 37 seconds before continuing upward and entering a kitchen. A heavy layer of dust coats all items in the kitchen. The refrigerator is left open. All food is spoiled. Adjacent the kitchen is a living area that subject enters slowly. There is a recliner, a couch, and a television all of 1950s style design. In the recliner is a laptop, whose case also resembles 1950s decor and is coated in heavy dust. Opening the laptop reveals the last moments of its operating system, Faithful OS, leaving a standby mode and immediately shutting off. Laptop has no external power source and will not power back on. When asked to recover the laptop, it brings the cushion of the recliner with it, the two stuck together. Subject advised to leave laptop where it is. The inside door leaving the home is nailed shut with thick wood planks. No attempt made to interact with these. 
Camera view pans to a staircase leading upstairs. Subject ascends the stairs without being asked, and the stairs remain silent to control surprise. When subject reaches the top of the stairs, a hallway with two doors is viewed, one on each side, and at the end of the hall, a dumbwaiter is inlaid into the wall. Subject opens door on the left on her own, which opens to a master bedroom. The bed is neatly made, but the wardrobe next to it is thrown open, and clothes are everywhere on the floor. Subject finds laid out on the bed several pieces of jewelry, and is informed to leave them. Subject begins to protest, then comments they stink, and leaves them alone, promptly leaving the room. Subject asks to open the second door. The second door opens and gives a view of a shared children's bedroom, obviously boy and girl, given the types of toys and clothes scattered on the floor. There is also a window which subject approaches and wipes with the curtain to clear dust. Subject requested to move camera to window and does so. The farmland is visible, and approximately 40 kilometers from it, at best guess, a city. As the camera starts to draw back, it pans down and films the area around the house. Approximately 300 figures, similar to those from the footage captured during blue test, are visible around the home, all staring up. Subject is asked to confirm figures, but states nothing is there. Subject requested to return, and quickly agrees. Egress from the house is uneventful. Pulley system shows no erratic behavior. As subject returns to point of pulley wire's origin, a loud groaning noise causes the picture to reverberate. Technicians at control report they were also able to hear the noise and experience the vibration. Subject returns through point of origin without investigation and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 relinquished. Video ends. Return newspaper fragments filed as Mirror Test 3 Color Violet Subject is D84930 Male 21 years of age Average physique Subject's background shows instance of second-degree murder of a police officer during a drug bust. Normally, this crime, while severe, would not qualify a person for a sentence that would end up with us, but the murder of the officer was especially brutal and excessive violence was used. This subject was uncooperative and had to be reminded that his cooperation would only benefit him. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a violet color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a cityscape, urban, lightly tinged in purple, similar to the first test. Video transcript as follows. Camera flickers to life and pans around the area. Subject is in what appears to be a modern downtown district similar to a city like New York. The streets are mostly bare except for a few cars of unknown make or model. These cars look highly advanced and streamlined. Subject attempts to look into the car windows without being instructed to, but backs away remarking there is a rank-ass stank coming from the areas around most of them. Subject is persuaded to move closer to one car, and does so with coughing, wiping off a window which is covered in dirt. The inside of the car appears to be completely filled with a strange brown matter. There is nothing at all visible other than the brown matter. Two other cars produce the same results, however a fourth vehicle seems more recent than the others and the insides are immaculate. The doors to this vehicle are also unlocked, and the subject quickly gets inside then shuts the doors. Subject is chastised for this behavior by Control, who reminds him his lifeline is nothing more than a cable, which is sturdy enough that closing the car door does not injure it, but they cannot recover a person in motion. Subject argues with Control over this issue and pans the camera across the dashboard, pointing out he couldn't drive away even if he tried. The dashboard is void of any recognizable controls, no ignition, no steering. It has several small blank screens that are theorized to be a GPS system. Subject remains in the car while Control discusses how to proceed since the city landscape is far larger than the previous test destinations. 
Control debates this issue while subject stares around the cityscape from the car. During one pan, a face is clearly seen staring into the car, eyes watching the subject. However, this was not noticed until post-test footage review. Subject made no comment regarding this entity at any point. Control shortly after informs Subject to remain where he is and an escort team is dispatched through the mirror to join him. A team of four armed personnel is sent through the mirror and proceeds to Subject's location. Subject is then instructed to remove his harness, which is recovered. This Subject's video feed then ends and is replaced by a wireless unit used by the escort team. The video quality on this unit is subject to more interference, but in order to mark the mirror exit, a receiver system is placed through the mirror. Subject leaves the car and now travels with the escort team. Given the myriad of possible options, they are instructed to simply move to the closest building and attempt to enter it. This building has etched glass doors bearing the name XEA Research Partners Inc. and the doors are ajar. A magnetic lock system is present, but has lost power. Team enters the building and main lobby. This area resembles a stereotypical corporate lobby. There is a C-shaped receptionist desk with a chair pushed far away from it as if it was left in a hurry. A PC terminal is at the desk as well. Team approaches the desk and the camera bearer is instructed to examine the PC. The unit does appear to have power, and Faithful OS appears on the screen requesting a login and password. A keyboard is present but is remarkably slim with touch-sensitive keys rather than press-down keys. After one failed attempt, the lock screen replies that maximum attempts have been exceeded and the PC turns off. No actual tower or power button can be located, so team moves forward. Behind the receptionist's desk are two elevator doors, one to the left and one to the right, with similar touch sense keys. The elevator on the left is broken, the door open and shaft empty. The elevator on the right appears functional and has power. Without a clear destination, the team is instructed to proceed to the highest floor to get a lay of the city. All floors appear to be accessible, with the highest being 114. In reality, 112, S13, and 113 are missing from the keypad. Journey up the elevator is uneventful during this time. The elevator does appear to take longer as it passes by 13 and then 113, suggesting that the entire floor was built and nothing put on it. At 114, the doors open and team enters a large lounge-type area. There are many couches with dust on them, a widescreen, apparently LCD TV of approximately 60 plus inches in size dominates the wall in front of them with no power. A series of windows are open, allowing in sunlight at the far end to which the team proceeds and angles the camera outside. The view of the city is astonishing. This building is one of the tallest visible, but certainly not alone in its stature. The city below is gray and silent. No evidence of life at this altitude. Some buildings in the city have a strange brown growth that appears to have been splashed against them, as if a gelatinous mass was flung and then seeped down before hardening. Other buildings have floors where the glass has been shattered and the same brown substance is seeping out the edges. One member of the team calls the camera bearer to the window on the other side. From the other side of the building, the city edges can be seen, Attention is pointed towards an expressway that encircles the city upon which crawls another of the large half-body humanoids, dragging itself with its elastic arms as witnessed in previous tests. It travels the highway, then moves out of sight. The team returns to the elevator and notes that a button has already been activated for floor 74. No one has approached the elevator, so the team agrees to travel to this floor. On the 74th floor, the doors open and reveal a waiting area to what appears to be a doctor's office. At the receptionist's desk, there is a sign-in sheet with a series of names and dates. The dates on the sign-in sheet all carry the year 1953. A PC at the receptionist area is on and functioning at a user desktop. 
The background for the PC is a large set of praying hands with the word Faithful OS under them. On the desktop are a series of folders with years on them containing files that, when clicked using the center button of the mouse, open to a word viewer. All files appear to be appointment information. On the desk is a notepad titled, From the Desk of Dr. Boritsitsky, Blessed Purificationist. The door to the doctor's area is sketched with the same name and title, as well as a crucifix. Opening this door leads to a white, dust-free hallway that has two examination rooms and a key-coded door at the end. The examination rooms are unremarkable and typical of any doctor's office. All medicine cabinets are empty. A small amount of C4 is placed at the lock to the key-coded door at the request of control and then blown, forcing the door open. The area it opens into is much larger than the reception area itself and seems to contain a series of large containment capsules. There are a total of six of these capsules. Two are broken and a brownish amber material coats the floor coming from them. One is empty and the last three have nude humans floating in them with breathing masks. Attached to the front of these tubes are medical charts showing vital signs and conditions. For symptoms, the charts explain in somewhat awkward English ailments that seem more like flaws of personality or character, or just incidents that have occurred with the patient. Control asks for a zoom of one of the patient pages on the chart. After focusing, it reads, Citizen Jennifer McZira did suffer a lapse of the heart that did lead her to lay with her neighbor twice upon the nights of her husband's departure from their home. Patient did submit herself into the Lord's and our hands for cleansing of mind and body. Prayer administered by High Father Wallachin and patient submitted to a three-day period in the Lord's tears to cleanse her system, then released in good spirits. The topmost page reads, Citizen Alberius Farafan struck out at a High Father during a sermon, blaspheming that the Lord's tears did turn his daughter to be unright in mind and heart thusly laying the blame of her whorish activities at the feet of the High Father and his blessing. With no proof of these blasphemes, the forgiving judge and the punishing judge did agree that Alberius Farafan should bathe in the Lord's tears himself for a week to be cleansed of mind and soul, thus to prove his daughter's ways are not fault of the Father's hands, and to give him peace of self. Subject who has been traveling quietly with the escort team now begins to panic. The camera pans to focus on him and he is surrounded by entities similar to those witnessed in the first two tests. Escort team reports in that subject is having a panic attack, but control requests them to stand still and wait. Subject screams at entities, which are denied to exist by team commander, stating subject is alone in the corner. Control requests that one team member be dispatched to approach and recover the subject. The escort team member approaches the subject as ordered. On the video, the figures part to make a pathway for the approaching member, who lifts subject to his feet and brings him out of the corner. Figures on the video are then seen closing ranks to close the path. Subject is lifted to his feet by an arm and escorted through the figures that close their ranks when the subject is moved. They remain steadfastly staring at the subject no matter where he moves to. Control requests the team to return now. Team turns to leave. Before leaving, a team member mentions something noticed at the reception desk, a binder labeled the Lord's Tears. Control requests binder to be returned as well, and it is stowed into subject's field kit. The team returns to the elevator and returns to the ground floor. Upon leaving the building, subject points down the street toward direction of entry point. The camera pans to a section of raised expressway, across which one of the large torsos is crawling slowly. The entity turns its featureless head to look at the escort team, raises its head to the sky, and emits a bellowing sound. Team leader issues the order to move, heading for the spot marked by the wireless video receiver. The creature on the expressway extends an arm down that stretches to touch the ground before the camera moves to the port. All team members save one move through the entry point. Subject moves through the entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. 
SCP-093 is dropped by subject who panics and tries to fight his way out of the room. D-8493 is terminated by field leader after he draws the field kit pistol. Team leader requests portal to be reopened, but it takes several minutes to find someone who can hold SCP-093 and generate a similar color. When a matching color is displayed and applied to the mirror, the video receiver is visible and all team members report a horrific smell. Team leader moves through the entryway with control person Dr. Sean Phillips. The uniform and possessions of the escort team member who was left behind are present and recovered, but the member himself is nowhere to be seen and does not respond to shouts. Member assumed KIA and wireless receiver recovered, control and escort return through entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. Later review of the recovered camera shows escort member Kate K grasping at the air where the entry point should be, and then turning to look up at the oversized torso. A brown gel seems to drip off the creature as it moves that disappears shortly after being dislodged as if evaporating. Several shots are fired at the creature's face with the automatic weapon carried by Kate that land in the face of the creature, causing a spray of less viscous brown liquid to pour forth from the wounds. Kate screams obscenities as the face of the creature descends upon him and the camera is pushed to the ground. Camera feed remains dark for approximately 65 seconds before light comes back and the camera films the creature crawling back to the expressway and pulling itself onto it, then crawling in the direction it was originally headed. Kate K is believed to have been absorbed by the creature and perhaps digested. This may have been an example of how these unknown entities feed by direct contact with living material. Further study is recommended to be avoided on this issue. Return ledger filled as This week's episode was possible thanks to our patrons. Joining us this week was... The Faceless Old Woman Who Secretly Lives in Your Home. Appreciate the Night Vale reference, thanks. Queen Cam. Forrest Hobbs. Jace Peck. Mr. Bumato. Brianna Fox. Imagine Eye Productions. Mirror Adorable. Evil Gabe. Cream. Mikey the Spade. Schmooples. Skylar Adams. Super Love 19. Mimic Satan, Ryan Legayan, Nathan Schutzius, 5,239 new patrons, Jared Jenkins, Matthew Shoopsoul, Barbara Jagal, Daniel Taylor, and James Marcellus. Thanks, guys. Your support means the world, and it helps us do what we do. This week's episode also featured the name of several patrons, uh, specifically Sean Phillips, Kate K, Z Thompson, Avalon Watson, Israel Mendoza, Justin Fritz, Lauren Acker, and Ryan Donahue. Thanks for being patrons for quite a while, and thanks for submitting your names. Uh, if you're interested in getting your name in the show as a character or uh, sometimes a corpse, you can find out more by visiting patreon.com slash scp underscore pod. SCP-093 was written by Nico Chris and unknown author. Our narrator was Alyssa Park. Dr. Sean Phillips was Graham Rowett. D-20384 was Russ Moore. D-54493 was Rissa Montanez. D-84930 was Brandon Nguyen. Technician Avalon Watson was Antoinette Barry Snowden. Israel Mendoza was Alvin Bowling II, and Ryan Donahue was David Dark. Our sound designer was Travis McMaster, and our music was done by Matt Roy Berger. And our theme song was made by the incredible Tom Rory Parsons. I'm your showrunner, Pacific S. Obadiah, and our producers are Tom Owen and Brad Miska. And this is a bloody disgusting show.